Today we're going to talk about one of the most influential people of the 11th century. One of the people who's created so much of the history that we've uh, become so passionate about. Today we're going to talk about Count Odo. That's coming up. So Count Odo is a fascinating figure in history. Bishop Odo is, is a, such an influential person. Not only is he half-brother to William the Conqueror, but he's also um, the person that made the invasion of England possible in many, many respects. For a long period of time during 1066, there were a lot of, of the nobles and the other knights that really were hesitant to join William's cause because they couldn't really understand why one Christian kingdom would go to such an extreme war against another. They could understand going to war against the Muslims or other heretics as they saw it. They couldn't understand going to war against another Christian kingdom, especially one who had a king that had been crowned. And therefore, what William the Conqueror needed was papal authority, that is authority from the Pope, to conduct his invasion. And it was Bishop Odo who arguably made this possible. He was born in around the year 1035. He was uh, the son of Haleva, who's also William the Conqueror's mother, or biological mother, and Herlem de Contivy. Now, I do apologise on my pronunciation of Old French here, by the way. He was made Bishop of Bayeux in 1049 by William the Conqueror. So really, at quite an, a young age, really, if he was only born in 1035 and he was made a Bishop in 1049, that would make him only 14 years old. Uh, bishop Odo is, is really three big things to history. Not only was he a, a very influential Christian, Christian cleric, he was uh, an incredible statesman and he was a warrior as well. Now, Bishop Odo convened the Council of Lilliburn in January of 1066, where he brought together much of the French nobility and he discussed, um, I guess, a lot of what was going to happen when. Edward the Confessor had died, how France was going to respond, and pushing for, uh, obviously, a very strong uh, agenda. In 1067, he became Earl of Kent, uh, and he was occasionally Regent of England when William the Conqueror was away on campaign. Bishop Odo led forces against at least two rebellions, including the revolt of the earls. He owned substantial land in 23 countries, roughly 20% of England, and much of that actually uh, is owned by his descendants today. If we just rewind slightly and go back to the Bayeux Tapestry, I find this really quite interesting. Bishop Odo is a highly distinctive character in the in the tapestry, probably because uh, he was the one who um, essentially ordered its production uh, and it was likely to have originally been made as much for him as anyone, although it was changed. Uh, and We'll talk about the Bayou tapestry in, in several upcoming videos, but there's very strong evidence that um, at least large parts of the Bay Tapestry uh, have either been lost or destroyed. For instance, um, there's no coronation of William, 
there's no siege of London and there's nothing about the uh, the revolt by the, the Saxons or the harrying of the north so those events alone would probably constitute another sort of uh, maybe 20 feet of tapestry I think there's a lot more to the tapestry originally than what we see today and I, I certainly think that William's coronation would definitely have been in there. So let's talk about uh, Bishop Odo on the uh, on the tapestry itself. Well, we know uh, he wears a very special garment. This is the one here. It, it looks like it sort of triangles, so to speak. Um, now, there's a particular name for this garment. It's called an, and I'm going to get the pronunciation wrong. An Epli Orkon. Uh, it's essentially a Byzantine styled garment and it's a, it, it's a padded protective garment worn by uh, nobility to essentially define their status um, and some clergy as well. So this is a heavily influenced by by the Byzantines it's quite possible we don't know but Bishop Odo may well have gone out through um, into Constantinople or something like that it's quite possible uh, at some point and and been quite taken by this style of garment I, I think this is very interesting because this is a very similar style of garment to what the French later knew as a jupon so a jupon is a, a essentially like a, a gambeson worn on top of the chainmail and if you had a gambeson on underneath the chainmail as, as you almost certainly would do then the the second gambeson made it um, the use of arrows and this kind of thing uh, very ineffective because of the air gap between the layers of armor uh, it's, it's very interesting, This it, it certainly doesn't seem to be a common garment and, and certainly wasn't really until much later in the medieval period. It wasn't really until the 13th century or so when the, uh, the jupon really sort of became popular amongst um, French nobility. The weapon that uh, Bishop Odo is seen with is a type of mace. Now, interesting, I say type of mace. So, a mace is one of the weapons that knights would have used. Uh, we don't see it in iconography very often, um, but we, we know that almost all knights certainly carried maces, um, especially during this period. It was just simply a secondary type of weapon. Um, and there's a variety of different maces that were used by um, the the Normans and various other groups in France. This particular style of mace is different to that used by William uh, and that's important to understand. So the mace that's used by Odo is called a baculus and it's more so a symbol of authority than anything. It's quite a long mace by its, uh, I guess the way that it's shown on the tapestry but it's a, it's a weapon all the same. Now, this is an interesting point because a lot of people have come to the belief that Odo carried a mace because of some sort of canon law and in the church which prevented him from using a, a, a sharp weapon. In other words, there was, an, there was a perception that clergy were not allowed to draw blood in battle. Now, I can't find any evidence of this in canon law. Uh, I certainly have researched this. Um, there is some statements by a gentleman called the Bishop of Beveray in 1217. Uh, again, I apologize for my pronunciation there, but I think it depends on how you interpret the bishop's um, uh, statement and it goes against certainly um, in 1217 it goes against everything that was going on at the time because um, many 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 clergy had been to the Crusades and fought in the Crusades and spilled blood in the Crusades in fact 
it's not that hard to look at the monastic orders and realize that most of the people who made up the monastic orders um, were at some level clergy. And certainly by today's standards, um, these were warrior monks uh, in these various monastic orders, such as uh, the Knights Templar, the Knights Hospitaller, and so on and so on and so on. So I think it's, it's, it's perfectly justified. And, and there's many examples of clergy in battle using a spear or a sword or an axe um, to cause harm, to spill blood. So I, I don't believe the uh, thoughts about the mace are very realistic. Um, and I, I think anyone on a battlefield really uh, is, is they're not there to bring flowers, let's put it that way. All right. There's uh, something else that's interesting with the, the tapestry, and I guess it also kind of um, shows Bishop Odo's influence on the tapestry, if, if he didn't actually um, you know, order it to be made, is that a number of uh, Odo's tenants were featured in the tapestry, uh, in particular Terold and Woodward. Wadard? I'm, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, I'm sorry. Um, but they are listed in the Doomsday Book as tenants of, of um, Bishop Odo. Just going back to the mace for a second, there's, there's several interesting uh, pictures of William in the tapestry where William is wielding a club. And in the first one, we see here, uh, William asks Vital if he has seen any of Harold's army. In the second, we have uh, William exhorts his soldiers to prepare themselves for battle. And in the third is the very famous shot of William taking off his helmet, saying, here is Duke William. So we can see that... Um, Bishop Odo was an incredibly important person and obviously had an incredibly close relationship with William the Conqueror. However, not that many years later, less than 10 years later, something seems to have happened, and we'll never know what now, where the relationship between William the Conqueror and Bishop Odo completely fractures uh, in the trial of Penn and Heath. Odo is forced to surrender much of his property, titles and assets. He's imprisoned. He's accused of planning a military expedition to Italy. Um, now, we don't know exactly the, the story behind that. Um, it's, it's quite possible and many people have speculated, um, keyword speculated, that Bishop Odo, his intention was possibly uh, to take the papacy for himself. So Bishop Odo wanted to become Pope. That may have included assassinating the current Pope. In fact, uh, after William the Conqueror died, in Bishop Odo then was heavily involved in a rebellion in 1088 uh, um, and where he was at Pevensey Castle he then had to submit to King William Rufus the son of William the Conqueror. However Bishop Odo seems to have uh, you know regained his relationship after that and he joins the first crusade with the second son of William the Conqueror Robert of Normandy. However, Bishop Odo dies in Patamino. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that one either. Sorry. Okay, so we have a very interesting character here. And as I say, so much of the history probably wouldn't have taken place without the influence of Bishop Odo. Because had he have not been able to secure the uh, the papal mandate for the invasion at Hastings, then that invasion may never have occurred and history would have turned out very, very differently.
Right now guys, thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please like, subscribe and share. I'll catch you in my next video.